and that is something that we as sisters always do. She's also asked to pray a spiritual reading, or uh, each one of us takes the scriptures and reads them, pondering them, making them meaningful to ourselves. So we do that uh, 15 minutes a day, and that is concluded uh, with a cross prayer that consists of six Our Fathers, six Hail Marys, and six Glory Bees, five to honor the five wounds of Jesus, and then the final one, the sixth one, for the Holy Father's intentions. And throughout the day, the sisters make their cross prayer three times, one after the reading. The Eucharist binds the sisters as one in the service of love. The holy sacrifice of the Mass, daily visits to and weekly benediction of the Blessed Sacrament, and adoration all remind them of God's great love. In particular, their daily visits to the Blessed Sacrament and adoration are opportunities to deepen their relationship with God. We at the Mother House are able to adore our Lord in the monstrance. Uh, the Blessed Sacrament is exposed from 4.30 until 20 minutes to 6 every single day. However, the sisters in the branch houses do have that visit to the Blessed Sacrament in their own chapels. Once the day is getting into the evening hours, we go back into community prayer again, and we begin at five o'clock in most of our houses with the rosary. We are sisters of charity of Our Lady Mother of the Church, so we do pray the rosary every day in community. And when we finish that prayer, we pray a prayer that was put together, was formulated by Pope Paul VI, and it is the prayer to Mary, Mother of the Church. It's called, uh, in the Liturgy of the Hours, Evening Prayer. Again, it consists of hymns and psalms. It is the Liturgy of the Church. After that prayer, we pray a prayer directly to our deceased sisters. It begins with, Dear Departed Sisters, and it's a beautiful prayer, asking these wonderful, valiant warriors who went before us to intercede for us and give us the vocations we need to help us in our work. Our aging sisters who are no longer able to be part of the very active apostolate, they make a holy hour every day for us. They are our prayer warriors in the uh, communion of saints also. One of our other important apostolates is um, St. Joseph's Living Center in Wyndham, Connecticut. It was an outgrowth of St. Joseph's Home in Willimantic that was an assisted care facility. Um, St. Joseph's Home has morphed into a holy family shelter for homeless families. We work to find them adequate and appropriate housing so that they can uh, you know, join society at a more appropriate level. Our sisters also run a food pantry here at the Mother House to help those who are in more desperate need in the area. And we work with local organizations to provide food and families come to pick up the food and sometimes the sisters deliver depending on what the circumstance is. So that's another important apostolate that we try to focus on to provide adequate care for those who are in need. The Sisters care for the infirm sisters at the Mother House in Baltic, Connecticut, and also minister to the elderly residents at St. Elizabeth Nursing Home and St. Elizabeth Manor in Wisconsin. By caring for the elderly as a work of faith, especially the Catholic faith, 
we say to the world, the little and the lost and the least, what the world sees as valueless, are so worthwhile because they're children of God. And actually, I draw my joy from the people that we care for, but just as much from the people who care for them, the lay people, because I see in them a commitment to these very frail, very elderly souls who often come to us lonely, forgotten. Um, they feel unloved, although they all have caring families, but they feel like they're not made to feel welcome in society. And so not only in giving them medical care, by giving of ourselves, we come to see the beauty of every soul that's been created by God. The suffering, either from physical pain, sometimes through the emotional pain of loneliness, through uh, being abandoned by their families, or they feel abandoned by their families, to be there for them and to help them to grow closer and closer to Jesus as they are approaching the time when they will join him forever. So um, that's in a, in a nutshell what we strive to do every day. Another work of charity that we have is our learning center. There are some students that fall behind for one reason or another, and so this gives them an opportunity to do remedial work, to catch up to their level. And so throughout the day, Sister has the summer school program where children can come for the summer. Sisters and, and teachers that teach on a daily basis to help them to bring them up to their grade level. The Learning Center began in 1958 when Mother Teresita and Mother Marie Alma were studying in a place in Massachusetts that was teaching them to work with learning and reading and learning disabilities. And they came to the Mother House and started the Learning Center here. Since 2000, we've had about 500 students come and there hasn't been anyone that hasn't been successful. One success story is a World War II veteran was 72 years old when he wanted to get his high school diploma. But the more we worked with him, the more we knew that was not possible. And then I called NFA after reading in the newspaper that World War II veterans, if they had their papers and they could testify that they went to a school like NFA, they could get their high school diploma. So we did all the, he had all, everything he needed. The Norwich Free Academy agreed to give him the diploma. And in two years, he went home to heaven. Teaching is a very important work, since the education of children is the future of the world. Students come to school from all kinds of backgrounds, and with the sisters, they learn the values of respect, love, and responsibility. They learn to pray to a God whom they know loves them infinitely. The children are very close to God, and Jesus is working through our schools and through our teachers, and especially when we try to bring the Christian values, the Catholic values that are important to us and into the world today, it is a real challenge because there are so many people who are not in touch with those values. We can bring Jesus to the people in our apostolates by striving for our own personal holiness. As we become more holy and more imbibed with Jesus in our own lives, it'll be a natural outpouring to the lives of the people around us, and He will be able to touch them through us. We have to be the instruments of Jesus in this life. The problems in the world today are too big for us. We have to place it in the hands of Jesus, and then He works through our hands to accomplish these great works in our world today. From all eternity, God has chosen in a special way those he wants to be his own. There is no set time as to when he will extend this invitation. For one called by Christ, accepting this invitation to become a bride of Christ, 
demands a total self-surrender to God and to all that he wills for her daily. This total gift of self embraces Christ's twofold mission of love, love of God and love of neighbor. I heard God calling me to religious life mostly through um, visiting the sisters I began in fourth grade and I started, it was the Franciscan Sisters of the Martyr St. George, which are near my home. Um, so I visited them onward through eighth grade. And then after that, I stopped visiting, um, got into high school and the, uh, the, th the sports and the activities, got involved with that. So I kind of lost the sight of religious life. But then um, my junior year of high school, they start prepping you for college. Um, the summer before my senior year, and went on a college road trip and the last stop on our road trip was at the St. Agnes Convent of the Sisters of Charity of Our Lady Mother of the Church in St. Paul and so we stopped there and visited them and there was just they were filled with so much joy singing and laughing with them and I never knew that sisters could have so much fun before I guess I always thought they were just in chapel just praying but you could see the joy so I wanted to find that joy mostly what I was looking for was that joy that they had that peace that they had so I was wondering how can I get that you know so then the whole ride home from St. Paul I was just thinking and wondering if this is where God was calling me to, to religious life, because there was so much joy, and when I went to the colleges, it just didn't fit, didn't seem to fit. And how I heard about the sisters was when, um, it was my sophomore year of high school, there was Sister Faustina, and she was there for a vocations fair, and then I just gave her my email, so that's how I started corresponding, and then religious life came back into the picture, and I started going to daily mass, and I think that's kind of how it started beginning, was that silence, finding that silence before him, letting him speak instead of me speaking, and asking all these questions and wondering, um, just letting him speak to my heart, and also it was my father who helped me to discern religious life. He was very persistent in helping me to persevere in this vocation. He was kind of the Holy Spirit speaking through him to telling me, maybe, maybe this is where you're supposed to be going in that direction. So that's kind of how it all began. The first time I realized that God had called me to religious life was the time when I couldn't stop going to Mass. I had to go every day. And the days where I did not go to Mass, I felt that there was this emptiness within my heart. And there was this longing in my heart for something greater than what I was doing and living within my daily life. And somehow I kept thinking of Jesus a lot. And my mother took me to this little nursing home in Janesville, Wisconsin. And there I saw for the first time sisters with habits. And it was amazing. I had never seen that before. And they just looked like angels. And one of those sisters came to me, a younger sister. And she said to me, um, you know, would you like to come visit us? And maybe, you know, you might want to be a sister. And I thought, I don't think so, sister beautiful, you look great, but that's not my life. As days went by, and the year went by actually, I started to go to Mass every day, and I got to a point where I could not stop going. And I started to long for Jesus very much. Eventually, the sister kept asking me, and another one was visiting one weekend, and she said, would you like to go with me over to Baltic in Connecticut? The first thing I thought, I love God, there's no way I'm going to be a sister. I said, well, at least I can go to Connecticut and see it. I've never been there. So I came and I was here in the mother house for three days. I couldn't believe it. It was just beautiful. All these sisters working, do, praying, doing so many things together. The prayer life was just beautiful. The community life was amazing too. Everything was just like a dream. During those three days, something within me told me that this was going to be my home. But the greatest of all were the moments when I went back home and I was with my mother and I went to the daily mass the day after I arrived from Baltic. 
And as soon as I received Holy Communion, as I was going back to my pew and I was praying, thanking God for the gift of just being at that mother house, I heard within my heart and in my mind, I saw it go back. And I knew without any moment hesitation that that was God asking me to return. And with great joy in my heart and in my soul, I said, yes, Jesus, I'm going back. And I cried and I cried and I was so happy. And then I came here and everything began to become the Bride of Christ. God speaks to souls in many ways. Sometimes he uses spectacular means, as in his call of Abraham and Moses. Sometimes Jesus calls a soul to his special service through a religious ceremony, a book, a word of a friend, 